Well, good morning. My name, is, as Al said, is, is Tabidi Anyabwile. It's uh, a name that's taken really from two different languages from the continent of Africa. Uh, it's a name that has wide semantic meaning. Almost every time I give a talk, it has a different meaning. Thabiti means, who did I take off to get the 8 a.m. slot? <laughs> and Anyabwili is a bit more spiritual. It means, praise God, they gave you free coffee this morning. <laughs> it's a joy to be with you. It's a joy to be thinking together about God's Word, thinking together about God's people, thinking together about the gospel and its importance, its relevance, its application to our lives. Not just when we hear the gospel and are converted for the, for the first time, when God by His grace opens our eyes to see Christ and to believe upon Him and to be drawn to Him in love and to follow Him, but in the following, to drink deeply from the gospel each day each moment, feed upon Christ by faith as we appropriate the promises of Christ in the gospel itself. And I wonder if you would this morning just join me for a word of prayer before we get started. Indeed, Father, we thank you for all the promises that you have made, every one of them yes and amen in Christ your Son. We thank you, Lord, that in having given us Christ, you have withheld no good thing from us. Indeed, you have withheld nothing that is sufficient for life and godliness. You've blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. In Christ, you've given us yourself. And we, as desperate people to hear you this morning, we beg of you to, to give us more of Christ this morning. As we look into your word, Lord, give us more of him who has saved us, more of him who has given his blood for us, more of him who was raised to life for us. Give us more of this one we love, this treasure in whom, O oh Lord, you have disclosed all wisdom. So speak to us and help us hear, we pray, in Jesus' name. Engage the culture, win the culture, change the culture, transform the culture, create culture. There's a lot of talk about the notion of culture these days. A lot of, a lot of things been written about the Christian responsibility, the, the church's responsibility for, for doing these things, engaging the culture, changing the culture, winning the culture, transforming the culture, creating the culture. It's an important topic and a, and a huge topic, but it's also one fraught with complexities and ambiguities and pitfalls. So let me just start, for example, with definition. What do we mean when we say culture? We all use that language, we all, we all appropriate that term, but I remember once in college reading a, a textbook, an a, a anthropology textbook that had an appendix that had 73 different definitions of culture used in the field. So what is it is an important question. When we think about culture, we, we generally think about the, the ways of being, the, the beliefs, the ideas, the worldviews, the practices of, of a particular people. Others have written more recently that Actually, we should just reduce culture down to the artifacts, down to the things that, that culture produces, those tangible products and goods which are a, a, a demonstration of what we make of the world. That's, that's Andy Crouch's approach to it in his book, Culture Making. So right from the outset, we see the difficulty. What is this thing that we are talking so much about in terms of engaging it and winning it and transforming it? But there are other difficulties too. I mean, at what level ought we to change the culture? Is it at the level of pop culture? 
I mean, should we be creating Christian Britney Spears? Is that even possible? Desirable. Or ethnic culture. Are we addressing the particular ways of being and thinking and believing and acting in the world that are associated with particular ethnic people? Or is it political culture? Are we to be advocating and advancing particular policies and, and governing strategies that, that at some level affect government and policy and law? Or is it high culture? The beliefs, the ideas, the sort of structuring ideas of a worldview or a culture? Or is, it, or is it all of the above? I mean, so when we're talking about engaging the culture, it in part depends upon not only what is it, but at what level are we attempting to do something? Then what does it mean exactly to engage the culture, to win the culture? What, what's the objective? How are we defining the result? What, is it, what does it look like? If we win, how do we know we won? A number, a number of recent writers have been, I think, particularly helpful in pointing out the very fluid nature of this idea of, of culture. It's, a, it's an amorphous kind of idea. We can't predict with any certainty how any action we take will, in fact, change the culture. And not only can we not predict if our actions will be effective at changing the culture, we, we can't predict the, the outcome of the change. It's a little bit like trying to, to predict and, and plot the individual water drops from a water sprinkler. That's a colossally confusing task. So what are we engaging? On what level are we engaging it? What are the terms or the objectives of our engagement? These are not small questions in an evangelical world that seems right now to be very gung-ho about this idea of culture and engaging it. So maybe we should just stop and ask, are, are these even the correct questions? Are, is the responsibility of pastors and, and churches to engage the culture? And assuming we can define the what of it and the how of it and the, and the objection, the, the, the measure of it, is it really what we're called to do? So I intend the bulk of this talk, since this is a pastor's conference, to be an engagement with pastors about our role, about what the Lord has called us to do. You know, it's really bad form for a speaker to project his own inadequacies onto his audience. But I'm gonna do it anyway. I, I, I'm gonna guess that most of you are, are like me. You know, you're, you're not Al Mohler. You're, you're not, Marvin Olasky, you're, you're, you're not Ravi Zacharias. Those guys have uh, an equipment package that, you know, let, let's face it, we, I, I don't have it. You don't have it either, most of them. <laughs> so it's important for us then to think carefully about what the Lord has called us to do, what the Bible exhorts us to do, what the Bible exhorts us to, to be, and, and what is then our task. There are those who are called in a particular way, I think, uniquely gifted to, to, to engage in a kind of public theology, a, a, a discourse with the, the outside world, and, and yet there are those of us who are pastors who are called to a particular task that we want to focus on. And to do that, I'd like to invite us to consider Paul's letter to the Colossians, Colossians, beginning in chapter 1, verse 24, on through to chapter 2. And, and here's the basic contention in this talk, is that if we set out to engage the culture, whatever that means, we will likely see in subtle and sometimes profound and sometimes disastrous ways the gospel being adjusted in that process of engagement if we're not careful. To put it another way, the idea of engaging the culture may be, may be so immediately plausible to us, to use Paul's language here, that we may miss 
the deeper, more important strategy of embodying the gospel itself. So if you're taking notes um, this morning, we'll hang our thoughts on four Ps here. We want to look first of all at, at Paul's pastoral purpose. What gets the apostle up in the morning? What, what gets his juices flowing? What's his, his purpose? What's his ambition, his aim? And then secondly, we want to see what philosophy drives that purpose, what, what view of things, what wisdom is animating his purpose. And then thirdly, we want to consider the, the practices then that flow from that philosophy. They are a distinctive set, a distinctive way of being that, that flow from that philosophy. And finally, a perspective, an outlook. It all hangs together. So his purpose, his philosophy, his practice, his perspective. Colossians chapter 1, beginning in verse 24. Listen, being reminded that this is God's word. Now I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake, and in my flesh I am filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, that is the church of which I became a minister according to the stewardship from God that was given to me for you to make the word of God fully known, the mystery hidden for ages and generations but now revealed to his saints. To them God chose to make known how great among the Gentiles are the riches of the glory of the mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Him we proclaim warning everyone and teaching everyone with all wisdom that we may present everyone mature in Christ. For this I toil, struggling with all his energy that he powerfully works within me. For I want you to know how great a struggle I have for you and for those at Laodicea and for all who have not seen me face to face, that their hearts may be encouraged being knit together in love to, to reach all the riches of full assurance of understanding and the knowledge of God's mystery, which is Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. I say this in order that no one may delude you with plausible arguments. For though I'm absent in body, yet I'm with you in spirit, rejoicing to see your good order and the firmness of your faith in Christ. Therefore, as you receive Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, rooted and built up in him, and established in the faith, just as you were taught, abounding in thanksgiving. See to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit according to human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of the world, and not according to Christ. For in him the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily, and you have been filled in him, who is the head of all rule and authority. In him also you were circumcised with a circumcision made without hands by putting off the body of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through faith in the powerful working of God who raised him from the dead. And you who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him having forgiven us all our trespasses by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. He disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him. Therefore, let no one pass judgment on you in questions of food and drink or with regard to a festival or a new moon or a Sabbath, these are a shadow of the things to come, but the substance belongs to Christ. Let no one disqualify you, insisting on asceticism and worship of angels, going on in detail about visions, puffed up without reason by his sensuous mind, and, and not holding fast to the head from whom the whole body, nourished and knit together through his joints and ligaments, grows with the growth that is from God. If with Christ you died to the elemental spirits of the world, why, as if you were still alive in the world, do you submit to regulations? Do not handle, do not taste, do not touch, referring to things that all perish as they are used, 
according to human precepts and teachings. These have indeed an appearance of wisdom in promoting self-made religion and asceticism and severity to the body, but they are of no value in stopping the indulgence of the flesh. If then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. For you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. What an amazing passage of Scripture. First thing we want to notice is Paul's pastoral purpose. We see it stated basically in verses 24 of chapter 1 down to verse 5 of chapter 2. As something that consumed the apostle. He was, he was swallowed up by it, caught up in it. It's expressed in two halves here, Colossians 1, 25. I became a minister according to the stewardship from God that was given to me for you to make the word of God fully known. And then in verse 28, him we proclaim, warning everyone and teaching everyone with all wisdom that we may present everyone mature in Christ. Paul's a minister to, to make the Word of God fully known, and he's making the Word of God fully known to present every Christian mature in Christ. I mean, he says he proclaims Christ. He proclaims the word about Christ. He proclaims the gospel. He instructs with both warning and teaching to pursue this one ultimate aim, namely to present his hearers, to present the churches mature, perfect, complete, whole in Christ. You might put it this way. His purpose is that every Christian in the entire body of Christ embody Christ spiritually be conformed to him completely. He wants to present the entire church, as he says in another place, as a, as a pure virgin, a, a, a chaste bride to Christ. That's his passion. That's, that's what he feels. That's, that's why the apostle gets up every morning. And, and look at what he says in verse 24. Paul says he, he joyfully suffers for this purpose. In verse 25 to 28, Paul preaches for this purpose. Chapter 2, verse 1, Paul says he toils, he works hard for this purpose. Paul is not lazy. He refers to how great a struggle he has for the Colossians and for Laodicea and for even churches that have not seen his face. He says that the care for all the churches comes upon him daily. Chapter 2, verse 5, he, he rejoices to see progress being made toward this purpose. It's as though Paul is doing all he can to take his listeners by the ears with the Word of God and to raise them up to Christ, to, to push them up into Christ, to, to make them conform to Christ. That's his aim. That's his goal. That's his pastoral ambition. So, brothers, is this our burden? Is, is this the singular purpose, the ambition that fuels and motivates our pastoral labors? Is this what we are consumed with? Is this why we drive to the, to the office and open the book and pray and counsel and prepare sermons? Are we aware that what God is doing with us is causing his people to be perfected in Christ? And before we come to engaging the culture, I think we need to be gripped by and overwhelmed by the beauty and the splendor of this task. I mean, how do we take that 63-year-old grandmother raising her three grandchildren? How do, how do we take that 17-year-old college hopeful trying to get good grades? How do we take that 35-year-old single woman desperately wanting to be married? Or that 42-year-old businessman professing Christ but too busy to give himself to his family and his church. 
or that couple experiencing marital difficulty, how do we grab onto their ears by the Word and press them up into Christ? That's our calling. That's our task. This is what Paul is focused on, but Paul, Paul understands there's a danger lurking. He writes to the Colossians, and he not only talks about his own pastoral purpose, his apostolic ambition, but he recognizes that there's a danger in the midst, chapter 2, verse 4. He says he's written everything to this point in order that no one may delude them with plausible arguments. The NIV renders it, deceive them by fine-sounding arguments. See, it's possible for a particular view of the church, a particular view of the pastoral ministry to sound right and be wrong and lead us from the best things in Christ. In other words, it's possible for a kind of teaching, a kind of idea to enter the church and displace the goal we should be focused on. That there can be a kind of mission drift where we, where we sort of falter away from the main thing and begin to take up maybe other good things but lesser things. And when it happens, oftentimes it adjusts the gospel by suggesting to us that the gospel is about something else, about something other than this ambition that Paul has. Perhaps it's about culture and redeeming culture. Perhaps it's about societal structures and so on. I think a lot of goal displacement, a lot of getting off task happens to us. It's freighted into our pastoral labors under the banner of the kingdom of God. There are lots of things that are inserted in our view as things we ought to be doing, things that sound really plausible, really right. Surely it's right to win the culture, engage the culture, transform the culture, right? That, that's what the kingdom is bringing, right? And so we should be doing those things. I want to read something to you here. Now you try and think of where this comes from. So surely theology will not become less Christian by widening the scope of salvation, by taking more seriously the burden of social evil, and by learning to believe in the kingdom of God. Right. Sounds plausible. Then this writer tells us his, his idea. He says, it's the old message of salvation, but enlarged and intensified. The individualistic gospel has taught us to see the sinfulness of every human heart and has inspired us with faith in the willingness and power of God to save every soul that comes to him. But it's not given us an adequate understanding of the sinfulness of the social order and its share in the sins of all individuals within it. It has not evoked faith in the will and power of God to redeem the permanent institutions of human society from their inherited guilt of oppression and extortion. Both our sense of sin and our faith in salvation have fallen short of the realities under the individualistic gospel's teaching. I think you can hear similar sounding things in so much of the conversation about the kingdom of God. Yes, it is about the gospel and individual salvation, but it is, is intensified and enlarged. It, it, it addresses social structures and, and so many other things. You know who wrote that? That's Walter Rauschenbusch in A Theology of the Social Gospel. That fine-sounding argument, that plausible argument enters into our hearing and we think, yes, 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 we're, we're nodded along just like the Colossians. And, and Paul writes to the Colossians and writes to us and says, wait a minute. The kingdom of God is focused on this, this irreducible minimum. The gospel addresses this irreducible minimum that individuals must repent and believe the message. And our history keeps telling us that when we, quote, intensify and enlarge the gospel, so many things are just driven right into the church to take us off the gospel and off our tasks, off our calling. How do we prevent that danger of mission drift? 
the loss of the gospel through adjusting the gospel by intensifying and enlarging it. We must be ruthless about rooting our pastoral purpose and the mission of the church in the Word of God itself and in the gospel itself. So just to make this plain, is it the purpose of the church to win the culture or engage the culture or change the culture? Is that your pastoral purpose when you show up Monday morning at the church office? I want to suggest to you that that very language, winning the culture, engaging the culture, changing the culture, as ambiguous as it is, the language itself signifies that mission drift is already underway. We are gospel men. We are proclaimers of this gospel. We are appliers of this gospel. We are, we are representatives of this gospel. We are stewards of this gospel. And, and the one thing we must do and not go away from is this gospel, is proclamation, is preaching. Think about the Apostle Paul in his social context. We tend to think that sometimes we live in a more complex world than the biblical world. But the Apostle Paul was living in a day where there were all kinds of cultural issues at play, major issues, major, major indications of the, the decay and the depravity and the corruption of society and people and cultures. There's widespread idolatry, there is, there's Roman occupation, and women are second-class citizens, there's the common practice of slavery. Now let's take that last issue, for example, slavery. How does the Apostle Paul, who understands what the kingdom of God is and understands the gospel, how does he address slavery? You know, it's interesting, when you read the New Testament and you look for indications of, of some address of a social issue like that, and you think about Paul, you, you're really left, you're tempted to make a couple of uncharitable judgments of Paul. That Paul's either a blind ignoramus who can't see the obvious, or that Paul does see a horror like slavery and he's callously unconcerned. But I think when we read the body of his letters in the end of the New Testament, actually, we see Paul operating on a more sophisticated and even more subtle, but ultimately more profound and powerful strategy to address the culture. And he's not addressing the culture per se. So the first thing he does, for example, is he writes to address the church, not the culture. His letters are written to God's people, not to the electorate, not to the, not to the voters, not to the citizenry at large. And so he writes and, and he centers his strategy on the redeemed, not the unredeemed. The second thing we notice is that with, with God's people as his audience, the apostle then defines slavery as contrary to sound teaching, contrary to the gospel itself. 1 Timothy chapter 1, verses 8 to 10. And in doing so, he helps the church understand how it is to be di different from the unlawful, different from the sinful, different from the disobedient, the ungodly, the, un the unholy, and the profane. He wants God's people to understand this issue as contrary to the gospel because it's only God's people who can think in those two, con in those two categories, consistent with the gospel, inconsistent with the gospel, consistent with the gospel, inconsistent with the gospel. And when he addresses God's people in that way, the, the third thing he does then is he, he pushes the gospel toward its radical implications. You see that in Philemon. You know, if you're looking for uh, an abolitionist tract from Paul in the Bible, you won't find it. If, you look, if you're looking for a letter written to a Roman official calling for uh, a, a new policy, you won't find it. He writes to a brother, and he writes to that brother, and he addresses that brother in the gospel and the implications of the gospel, and he says, now let this, this love dynamic that is part and parcel to the gospel, that flows from the gospel, let that change how you address this issue. And all of this, 
Paul is making the embodiment of the gospel in the church, the explosive charge that he puts at the, at the load-bearing walls, worldly cultural practices, and, and brings them down by, by making a, the church a clear cultural alternative. He undermines then the prevailing cultural norm. He engages the culture by engaging the church. Paul's singular purpose is to present every Christian mature in Christ. So what he engages is the church, the believer, with the gospel itself. And that's how he creates the alternative to the world. That's his purpose. Notice, two, his cultural philosophy. Verses 6 and 7, therefore, as you receive Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, rooted and built up in him, and established in the faith, just as you were taught, abounding in thanksgiving. In other words, Paul argues that since the Colossians have responded to the gospel by receiving Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge, they should now walk in Christ. They should walk in that treasure of wisdom and knowledge. And he says here, that's what you were taught. He says at the end of verse 8 there, notice there, that they should be taken captive to Christ, according to Christ. It's as though Christ has come into their village, marauding the village, and he has led them out in, in loving shackles. And they should then walk in Christ for he is Lord. They should establish their, their values, their, 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 their way of thinking, their conduct in Christ. See, there he uses that agricultural metaphor to be rooted in Christ, to, to, have, the, to have the, what do you call those things, the roots, <laughs> go down into the soil, which is Christ. And he, he uses that building metaphor, and then they should then be established and, and grow up in Christ. They should be erected in, in Christ. And how do you do that? Pastor, how do you help your people to do that? How do we help them to be rooted in Christ, established in Christ, be confirmed in Christ? I think the answer to that begins in verse 9. The short answer is, it's the gospel. Teaching them to live, to think, to act in the good of the gospel. So notice there, Paul says, verse 9, he begins to talk about the person of Christ. The whole fullness of deity dwells bodily in Christ. In verse 10, the same Jesus is the, the head of all rule and authority. Gee, this, is, this is high Christology, Christology. This is not Jesus is your boyfriend or your homie. He's not your feel-good mate. Jesus is God fully, and he rules totally. He is the sovereign Lord of all creation. I love the Kuiper quote. There's not one square inch in, of all of existence over which the Lord Christ Jesus does not declare mine. And here he is, Paul, saying, look, look at this Jesus. He tells us who Jesus is, and then he, he goes on to tell us, he reminds the Colossians and reminds us what benefits they have received since they have come to believe in Christ, the, the promises and the benefits of the gospel. Notice there in the first part of, of, chapter, of verse 10, he says, you have been filled in him. Look at that. The fullness of God dwells in Jesus bodily, and we have been filled in him. We need nothing more. We need no new philosophy, no new ideas. Christ is all and in all. And then he says, verse 11, you've been spiritually circumcised. In him you were circumcised with a circumcision made without hands by putting off the body of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. And then he switches now uh, to a different aspect of the gospel, another way of talking about the gospel. He talks about, about baptism. We have been buried with him in baptism. We died with Christ. And he says, not only that, we were resurrected with Christ. We were raised with him through faith in the powerful working of God. There's regeneration. 
It reminds him that there's new life. You who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him. He switches the angle again. He turns the diamond again. And he then describes it from the, from the vantage point of forgiveness. All of your trespasses have been forgiven in him. In verse 14, he tells us which instrument the Lord used to accomplish this great salvation. It was his cross. He canceled the record of our debt, the legal sanctions that we owed, death and wrath, by nailing it to the cross. Paul is teaching his people to wake up in the morning and to live the day hearing the pounding of the nails in the cross and recognizing that their sins have been nailed there with Christ. He's teaching them to recognize that in Christ they have, they have received fullness, and, and in Christ they have received life, real life, eternal life, abundant life, indestructible life. All the treasures of God's wisdom are in Christ, and they are in Him. Think that way. Live that way. Perhaps you're here this morning and this all sounds new to you or strange to you. Perhaps you're here and, and over the course of the talks, you, you've been perhaps made aware that, that you have been living not in Christ, but you have been living according to some other philosophy, some other idea of life, pursuing some other gain. Maybe you've been made aware of your sin. Maybe you've been convinced that you're a sinner. You've been convinced that you are guilty before God. You have the awareness. You can't explain it. Neither can you shake it. For every time you consider your life and consider the way you live, you see, you see sin. You see its effects. The solution to that is to be in Christ. The solution to that is to be joined together with Christ in such a way that your sins are completely removed. The guilt that you owe is, is removed. The penalty that you owe is paid. To be so joined to Christ that, that not only is your guilt removed, not only is there forgiveness for your sins, but a perfect righteousness is provided to you. And the question you should be asking is, how can I be joined to Christ that way? How can I be joined to Jesus in such a way that all of my debts are cleared with God, that all of my sins are forgiven, and yet I also have this perfect righteousness and this treasure of wisdom? It's by turning from your sins, and it's by believing, it's by trusting, it's by leaning upon Christ to be your Savior, to rescue you from your sins to make you one with himself, and in doing so, guaranteeing you eternal life. Perhaps you've come this morning and you have never trusted Christ and never turned from your sins. Beloved, do so this morning. Do so even now. Call upon his name and you shall be saved. And this is what Paul is teaching the Christian church to always live in, to, to have the gospel be their philosophy. And he identifies in verse 8 uh, another danger. As we work through these Ps, we're, we're looking at what Paul affirms, and we're looking also at the dangers, at the concerns, the fine-sounding arguments that, that he worries about as adjusting the gospel. And we see another one here in verse 8. It's in parallel to verse 4. He says, see to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit according to human tradition, according to the elemental spirits or principles of the world, and not according to Christ." The warning here is clear. We might put Paul's concern this way. When it comes to our philosophy of a Christian life and ministry, of, of even something like cultural engagement, the question is, are we captured by Christ or are we captured by worldly philosophy and tradition? Is it the world's ideas we hear or is it Christ and the gospel that we hear and attend to? Again, he uses that imagery of, of captivity, of enslavement. Both 
both Dr. Sproul and Dr. Moeller on yesterday gave us a, a rich litany of the, of the worldly philosophical movements that have, have crept into the church and, and snuck out of the camp holding Christians captive. So it's too numerous to recount. But the end is the same. Here's how Jesus put it. Human tradition makes the word of God of no effect. Here's how Paul put it in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 17. He says, now, if we depend upon the eloquence of human wisdom, we make the cross, we empty the cross of its power. So when Paul writes verse 8 here of chapter 2, with one grand stroke of the quill, he wipes away old worldly philosophies and, and worldly principles as any kind of sufficient or satisfactory or needful basis for the Christian life and the Christian church. He sets the gospel over and against, over and against the tradition of humanity, the, the philosophies of the world. Dare I say it? There's an antithesis here. Christ may not be reconciled with the world. He, he may not be blended together with the principles of the world. Now, now, we have to ask ourselves at this point then, if our approach to cultural engagement or winning the culture takes seriously this biblical antithesis if it takes seriously the dangers inherent in the world or the unsuitability of the world's philosophy for Christian living. I think there's a tendency to underestimate the, the lethal potency of the world and its philosophy. The world's philosophy, the world, is not a safe place. The world is not like some, some colorful Play-Doh, which we may just sort of pick up and, and form in our hands into interesting little shapes. The world shakes back. We manipulate, but it manipulates back. And so there's a soberness that we need when we come to this question of engaging the culture. If the culture is unpredictable in, in both our ability to change it and unpredictable in the changes that result from changes, We'd better be prayerful and discerning. Henry Van Til in his Calvinistic concept of culture wrote this. Now it ought to be observed that one of the most subtle tactics in the arsenal of Satan is the attempt to soft pedal the antithesis, to lull the people of God to sleep so that they become at ease in Zion and are complacent with respect to the world. Satan is ever trying to camouflage his real intention. He tries to make the world look innocuous to the people of God. He would have the people of God labor under the impression that there is a neutral zone in the world, a spiritual no man's land in which they may hobnob with the enemy with impunity. In other words, there's a deep antithesis between the kingdom and Christ on the one hand and the world and culture on the other hand, and if we imagine that something called secular is the same as safe and neutral, already we're being deceived by fine-sounding arguments. It is not neutral ground. It is a ground that manipulates the culture or manipulates the gospel. And think how often the Bible tells us about this antithesis this deep divide and opposition between the kingdom of Christ and the kingdom of this world. Already Paul has mentioned it in Colossians chapter 1, verse 13. He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son, in whom we have redemption and the forgiveness of sins. The gospel moves us from one domain into a completely different domain. Well, think of the Lord's words in John 18, verse 36, where he says, very simply, my kingdom is not of this world. My kingdom is not from this world. Remember what Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 and 2 tells us, that this world is the pattern of life that has led to our spiritual death. There Paul writes, you were once dead in trespasses and sins in which you, you once walked following the course of this world. 
and the world continues its warfare with God. James 4, verse 4. Do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? It's black or white. Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. 1 John 2, verses 15 and 16. Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh and the desires of the eyes and pride and possession is not from the Father, but is from the world. Uh, that, I think, challenges our, how we understand common grace in culture and the good things of culture. And this is why Romans chapter 12, verse 2, those, those famous words Paul commands, do not be conformed to this world any longer, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that you may, by testing, you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. The demonstration of God's good and perfect will is enabled by the the transformation, the no longer conforming to this world. To quote Van Til again, he says this, a Christian unaware of the problem of leading a Christian life in a non-Christian society is progressively being de-Christianized by all sorts of pressures that operate upon him through the culture. A Christian, unaware of the problem of leading a Christian life in a non-Christian society, is progressively being de-Christianized by all sorts of pressures that operate on him in the culture. Paul's concern, and I think our concern, ought to be that our people may not realize that. Our people may not be thinking about the world and the culture with the ethical connotations that the Scripture assigned to the world and thus they're vulnerable to being carried away captive to other philosophies, other points of view. Let me see what this means for engaging the culture. If our engagement is uncritical and we come to depend upon its philosophies and traditions, those philosophies and traditions will be Trojan horses mimicking the gospel brought into the camp of God's people and when open, will be absolutely empty. We will have vacated the gospel itself. We will have abandoned it for something that is not the gospel. And that's why Christians who swallow the world's materialism, for example, end up with a bankrupt prosperity gospel, as we heard last night. The gospel is accommodated to the materialistic impulses of the world. And many people who hold the prosperity gospel, let's be honest, they are in their own way attempting to engage the world in a sense. They are are attempting to to display to the world what they think is is God's promises in the way of prosperity, that the world might see the prosperity of God's people and be attracted. I just want to suggest to you that's that's just a glorious example of being swept away by worldly philosophy masquerading as the gospel, by materialism. So almost without fail, discussions of engaging the culture and winning the culture include some rationale for using the culture in ways that undermine the gospel. And it's because if we adopt the world's philosophy, we've just switched grounds. We were to be rooted in Christ, but now we are planting ourselves firmly in the world. And Paul says here, walk in Christ. Augustine's classic words from the city of God. Two cities have been formed by two loves, the earthly by the love of self, even to the contempt of God, the heavenly by the love of God, even to the contempt of self. The former, in a word, glorifies in itself, the latter in the Lord. For the one seeks glory from men, but the greatest glory of the other is God. The one lifts up, his, lifts up his head in its own glory. The other says to its God, thou art my glory and the lifter of mine head. The wise men of the one city living according to man have sought for profit to their own bodies or soul or both. And those who have known God glorified him not as God. But in the other city, there is no human wisdom. 
but only godliness, which offers due worship to the true God and looks for its reward in the society of the saints, of holy angels, and as well as holy men, that God may be all and in all. There are two cities and two people. It's the city of God and the city of man. They live for different glories. They live according to different philosophies. And this has implications for our practice, our religious and our cultural practice. Paul begins then to address that in verses 16 to 23. We're not surprised that a worldly philosophy and a a worldly outlook on life leads to then a, a worldly approach to approaching God and a worldly approach to cultural observance. So Paul gives two warnings here, verses 16 and 18. He says, therefore, let no one pass judgment on you in questions of food and drink or with regard to a new moon or a Sabbath. And then again in verse 18, let no one disqualify you insisting on asceticism and worship of angels going on in detail about visions puffed up without reason by his sensuous mind. Let no one judge you. Let no one disqualify you. Those are the twin dangers. That, that we will begin to sort of think of ourselves not in light of the gospel, but in light of the judgments of others. Judgments made not on the basis of the gospel, but, but judges made on self-made religion, asceticism, forms of self-righteousness, forms of attempting growth that are not gospel growth. The people making these judgments were apparently inside the church in Colossae. This had crept into the teaching of of that particular church. And when Paul says, though, let no one judge you in this way, I, I take it he would mean both inside and outside the church. And when he goes on to address food and drink and particular religious days, and maybe he has in mind a, a kind of Judaizing influence, a a reference to uh, Judaism and Jewish cultural practices, but but I think it applies more broadly to culture and the influence of culture in the church. But he says there in the end of the chapter that such an approach is, while it has an appearance of wisdom, it is futile. It does not subdue the flesh. Only the gospel does that. Here, I think, is an interesting problem for us. Because if it's true that Paul's approach to engage in the culture is to engage the church and to push the church up in Christ and to have the church adopt Christ as its philosophy and, and to then live out of that philosophy, we're faced with an interesting question about how then does our various cultures relate to that pursuit? How then do we, coming from various cultural backgrounds, looking around this room, in one church, live out a Christian life that is not dependent upon those cultural things that are a part of the world? I would suggest to you that every human culture is fundamentally apostate. That every human culture is fundamentally apostate. I think that's the gist of Augustine's quote, and we'll trace it biblically, that there are two cities, the city of man and the city of God. Now, if every human culture is fundamentally apostate, and we're all saved from all those ethnic backgrounds and those cultural backgrounds into this this new humanity, into the church, I think that implies that that part of what it means for, for us to push our people up into Christ is it's for them to be a little bit like snakes shedding the old skin, shedding the old cultural skin, the old cultural expectations, the old cultural ways of being. You see, every people group has a culture. If I were to say to you, you know, that, that Maria, who is with us today, is, is Filipino, you, you would associate that not just with a, a, a particular look, but you would associate that with a, a particular cultural orientation. Or if I were to mention another brother here who's from who's Zulu, who's from South Africa, you would, you would begin to think that there's some cultural difference. There's some cultural way of being that in part makes him Zulu. Or, or if I were to say there's a, there's a Malay person here, you, you get the picture. Every people are in part defined by their culture. Now here's the question. 
what does it then mean for us to be God's people? Does it not necessarily mean that God gives us a culture? a distinctive cultural way of being, a distinctive cultural practice? I, I think that's in part can be seen in, in, in the very way in which God calls his people to himself. You remember in Genesis chapter 12, right after Genesis 11, where man demonstrates that, that human culture is, is staggeringly apostate in the Tower of Babel. They're gonna make a name for themselves God then calls Abraham out of a pagan land and says, I'm going to make you Israel, essentially. You realize that the, that the first Jew was a Gentile? Let that rest with you for a while. God takes this pagan man from a pagan land, and he says, I'm going to make you my people. You're going to have descendants as numerous as the sea. And, and notice what happens is, is God begins to not only multiply Abraham through his descendants, but, but eventually, Exodus through Deuteronomy, he begins to separate them from the pagan lands to bring them into a land that, that he has promised them, and in that land he's going to give them his law for them to live by, and that law is going to address their cultural and civic and religious life. And over the long centuries of being God's people, they are steadily acquiring a different culture. Until we come to the point where in, in, in Ephesians 2, for example, Paul could make reference to the law and its regulations and say it, 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 there was a dividing wall of hostility. So separate were this new people of God who were, who were called to embody the culture and practices of God that they were set over and apart from all the other peoples of God. Now, does that process stop with Israel? It's striking when you consider the book of Acts the running challenge through that book. Acts chapter two, the, the, the apostles speak in tongues and the people hear them in their own language. You have all of these Jewish people from all these various nationalities and backgrounds and, and they're being assembled as the church. It's striking that when we come to Acts six, the first thing we have is a kind of ethnic tension Greek speaking Jews, Hebrew speaking Jews, a, a disparity in distribution. And then we move on a little bit forward, uh, and then we get the Gentile question. It's always interesting how the majorities refer to the minorities who are coming into their experience as a question. We used to have the Negro question in the States. Here now, look at what happens. We come to Acts chapter 10, Peter's sent to Cornelius, and Peter preaches the gospel, and, and the Spirit falls on these Gentiles. And, and in Acts chapter 11, Peter's boys, his Jewish boys, say, man, what you doing over at the Gentile's house? You see, there's a Gentile question. And Peter said, look, man, I preached the gospel, and the Spirit fell on them like it fell on me. If the Spirit, you know, the Spirit said, cool. So, you know, I was cool with it. And sort of grudgingly, they went, okay, okay, all right, all right, all right. Uh, yeah, yeah. See, CJ, Peter had pulled the Holy Spirit card on him, see? <laughs> Wise move. <laughs> what happens next? Acts chapter 15, Jerusalem Council. See, the, the joining together of, of Jew and Gentile in the church and, and the, the cultural fissures and eruptions that were happening as they were putting those peoples together raised the question of what does gospel like, life look like? What is the gospel and how do we embody it? How do we put Jew and Gentile together? And it's striking, it's striking to me to read Acts chapter 15 at the Jerusalem Council and to hear the verdict. Because here you have these guys, these, these folks from Jewish backgrounds who had been for centuries regarded as God's people wrestling with the question of how do we include these people who had been outside the covenants for centuries? And they say basically this. Let us not put any other burden on them other than what the gospel demands. In other words, they didn't say, let them become a little more Jewish like us. 
Let them be circumcised. Let them identify with who we are culturally. I think there was a process happening there whereby not only Gentiles but also Jews were being shed of that sort of natural, human, cultural, philosophical system that, that we all have and being molded into a new people with a new culture, with a new practice consistent now with the gospel. I think part of what it means for us as pastors to push our people up into Christ is to help them shed the old snake skin and to help them live in this new skin of Christ, this new practice of Christ, approaching Christ. Notice what, what Paul says there in verse 17. All those other things, the, the culture, the religious observances, etc., they were a shadow. But the substance, the body, the it of it, is Christ. Christ has come, and now our practice is Christ. We live out the life, and He's living in us. And I think that, that reminds us that there is a unique threat to the gospel. It's that threat of being complacent, relaxing into, being unquestioning, about who we were culturally and naturally. It's a threat that says, let me just gather with people like me. It's a threat that says, yeah, well, you know, culturally I prefer this style of music, so I'm, I, this is where I'm gonna hang out. It's a threat that suggests to the world that Ephesians 2.14 is false. Christ has become our peace. He himself is our peace. He has abolished the dividing wall. He has destroyed the hostility in his body. He is the substance. In his body, he has made the two one. And it's the gospel that is the only conquering force of hostility and enmity, first with God and then with each other. And so this, this attempt to acculturate the gospel, to make it fit into our own cultural confines as we engage the culture, is an adjustment of the gospel and less than the gospel. When we say church, I, I, I would implore us to think, to understand, to see, whenever we hear the word church, certainly not the building, certainly not just the Sunday gathering. When we say church, it implores us to think people, and not just people, but by definition, nations. The church is a multi-ethnic thing. Let me be clear, it is, it is not only inescapably multi-ethnic, biblically, but it's not multicultural. It is multi-ethnic, but it is, it is monocultural. And it's not any of our native cultures. It's this new way of being that God is creating through Christ in the gospel. It is a gospel culture, and that's the practice that Paul wants his people to embody here. We should, we should be reminded that we, we ought not be like players on the NFL all-star team. You know, every year the NFL has an all-star selection. They choose the best players from the, from the league, and they, they are appointed to their respective divisions' teams. It's an interesting thing that, that they all wear the same colored jersey. So, you know, the, the NFC has on, say, blue, and the AFC has on white. Ladies, I'm sorry for the sports analogy, but bear with me. But it's striking that though they all wear the same jersey, they, they don't really play for that team. They all have different helmets. They wear the helmets of the team that they really play for the folks who pay the, the big contract. So when they come to this game where, they, where they're playing in the all-star game, you know, they don't really hit hard. They don't really run hard. You know, they just, you know, move kind of gingerly, you know, things just like that, you know. I don't want to mess up my contract, you know. Because they really play for the other team. It strikes me that so often we're like NFL players on the all-star team. We wear a jersey that says Christ, but we wear, we wear a helmet that says ethnic culture. That's the team we play for. That's the side we're on. 
After we finish this little thing, I'm going to go back and play with my squad. I'm not going to run hard with those not on my squad. We need to flip that. And it's the gospel that enables us to do that. And Paul is calling us to that. We should conclude with our final observation. Notice Paul's pastoral perspective. Ephesians chapter 3, verses 1 to 4 there. If then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things that are above, not, not on things that are on earth, for you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. You've all heard that saying, don't be so heavenly minded, you're no earthly good. Just doesn't fit with what Paul says right here. The only way to be of any earthly good is to be increasingly heavenly minded. And so Paul, in one sense, is ending where he began. He says, my ambition is to present them mature in Christ. And and here he's telling us to be absorbed with Christ in our perspective, to, to look up and to look out, to look up at Christ where he's seated in the heavenly realms because that's where we live and to look out to his coming. For when he comes, he's bringing our life with us. Right now, our lives are are hidden with Christ in God, verse 3. But when he appears, verse John 3 says, we shall see him and seeing him be like him. And we are to be people then who, who set our minds on that perspective, on Christ's coming, of living for that world to come. We are to be people who are looking for and leaning toward and longing after the the person and the place where Christ lives. Minds are to be on things above. If we engage the culture with an earthly mind, the results are in verses 5 to 11. It's earthly living. We will hardly escape looking like the world, all of its depravity. So we need desperately to raise our gaze from the culture and and to adopt a new perspective, to think upon Christ. For as we look for him and look at him, we'll look like him. And so the apostle ends here, pushing us up into Christ. Can you see what he said? It's all simple. Our purpose is Christ. Our philosophy is Christ. Our practice is Christ. Our perspective is Christ. It's Christ. It's Christ, 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 Christ. Because the gospel is Christ. Let us be given completely to it. Let's pray together. Father, we are taken with the fact that winning the culture means looking like Christ. The change in the culture which we wish to see really is a change that you work by your spirit and your grace in the lives of individual hearts. To resist the culture is to live for Christ. To engage the culture is to be more fully in Christ. Lord, we wish to look like and be like Christ your Son. We wish not, O Lord, to have the gospel adjusted by fine-sounding arguments, plausible, speeches, but we desire, O Lord, to embrace your Son more fully, to be unshakably tethered to him, to be taken captive by him, to be with him where he is, O Lord, to see his glory. Help us, O Lord. Keep us, O Lord, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.